Hello, my friends, how are you doing? So today I want to do a reaction video to the Marquez Brownlee review of the Humane AI pin. Now, usually on my channel, I don't really talk about bad products, but in this case, I want to make an exception. The reason for that is because I think this is kind of an historic moment. So why is this so important? As you know, right now, there's a lot of interest globally. There's a lot of investment globally into AI, and you could call that a bubble growing. The reason of a bubble burst is when there is a lot of investment and not too much return. And that is a huge problem for two big reasons. First of all, if there is huge global investment with no or very little return, this can lead to a global recession and that is bad for everybody. But the other thing is, if there is a bubble burst, there is going to be for a long time a very low amount of investment in these types of new technology. And so bad products can actually globally damage the progress of AI technology. That's a bad thing. And this is why this I feel is very important. Also, I will cut out several parts of his video, not just because he's using licensed music that I can't play on my channel, but also because his review is rather long with 25 minutes. Also, of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like this video. The new worst product I think I've ever reviewed. That already is a very strong statement from Marquez Brownlee because he is very, very reasonable, very, very honest with his reviews. So for him to say that has to mean something. It's so bad, in fact, that I think it's actually kind of distracting to like understand what the point of the device is. From the first moment I saw this and also the rabbit one, I thought this can't be a good idea. There, For me, in my head, there is no reason why this shouldn't be an app on your phone. And you can already see with the integration of Gemini into the Google services, how much more valuable an AI is when it is embedded in a rich landscape of applications where you already have a lot of your data, your connection, your services, your friends, and so on. It's about the size of a large watch. It has a camera and a microphone and can interact with the world around you. But in case you can't use that as input, there's also a touchpad and a projector inside with this super new style of gesture control with the projection on your hand. I feel personally that a lot of the design and the quality that went into the design is to drum up, to hype up this kind of vintage Star Trek feeling. Everybody always wanted to have this thing where they just touch here and they say something and magic happens. This might not be the best idea, especially because it guides technology not by the usability and how to make it the best product, but rather how to sell it in the best way and be most appealing to people who have the funds to buy this product. It costs $700 plus a $24 a month subscription plan for the data that comes with it and all the services and all the online storage. It's already a fun start. The thing is they had so much funding for that product. So how come that they couldn't have at least very low subscription for that at the start? especially when the product doesn't perform so well. What are you actually paying for on that monthly subscription if you can't really use the service that well? I do understand, of course, that early adopter products are expensive and kind of meant to be expensive because they are built and delivered in a very small quantity. But this is not a device where you say this is for the first batch of developers who will make stuff with this. This is their actual product launch. And while the Apple Vision Pro has had a similar approach with their device. They open it up right away for developers to get their newest apps and inventions onto their device. So we have seen a rapid influx of new apps springing onto that device. They made contracts with a lot of companies. They used their full power and movement to really place this as well as they could. And of course, on the other hand, you have the Rabbit One, which is only $200. It might have a better chance. They might be a lot more open to include a lot more services, connect that to a lot bigger landscape. And that, after all, is the most important thing. How well embedded is it in the space you already live in and do your daily things in? One of the big things off the top is this does not pair to your smartphone at all. This is its own standalone device 
with its own internet connection, with its own phone number. And so this little AI assistant just goes everywhere with you. It's always connected. And that's, you can choose how much or how little to use it alongside your smartphone. I feel like that's a super crazy decision on their side. How can this not connect to your smartphone? Of course, at that point, people would rightfully say, why is it not just an app of my phone? One of the biggest and strongest elements that you can have with a new device is to be able to connect to things, import your contacts, import your data, so you can right away use it, connect it with everything you do, share it with the people out there and make the transition to adopt this new technology as easy and seamless as possible. And I feel like with this decision, they just made it as hard as possible to pick this device up and really use it. The idea is you talk to it like a person. It answers questions. It gives you historical facts or personalized recommendations or helps you out with things like brainstorming or remembering things. It can make phone calls and send text messages, a ton of stuff. The unfortunate reality though, is this thing is too much of a pain to use to actually want to do most of that stuff. And that is also one of the major points. If you have something that is new and you charge a huge price, this is very different from the open source community. All these other tools that might not work, that might be a pain to set up a huge learning curve to get into, you highly expect things to be complicated and not work. But if you pay 700 bucks, you have a monthly subscription and then it just can't deliver, and the crazy thing is you already have apps in your smartphone like ChatGPT who do that. You can speak to ChatGPT with your voice and get these answers in no time. It works like magic. And then you have a pin and it can't even do that in a nice time, in a nice way. Not good. That's not a good look. The hardware packaging actually kind of accomplishes that. Like this pin is solid. It's aluminum. It's dense feeling. Uh, there's three colors actually. There's all matte black, which is the cheapest one, or for a hundred bucks more, you can get white or this black and silver one that I'm using. And then there's a lot of sensors packed up there. There's a camera, there's microphones, there's lights, there's a tiny class two laser projector. So this whole thing is like really densely packed. And then the magnets also that connect everything are super strong. So the back of this pin is called a booster. It's another battery. So it's got its own internal battery, but then once you attach it to your clothes, it cleverly through your clothes magnetizes there, makes a nice sound when you do, and that's how you get it attached. The interesting thing about that is, first of all, why does this small device that is already as big as a Apple smartwatch needs to have two batteries? And then it has to charge through your shirt. So this is inductive charging. It's not direct charging. There is no pin that is directly connecting. So you're losing a lot of power while the charging is going on. All of that is kind of strange. And again, I feel like all of that design is built on this kind of vintage Star Trek vibe. A lot of that doesn't really make any sense. So again, think of this thing as an AI assistant that's like by your side all the time with you. So you can ask it things. It doesn't have a wake word. It only turns the mic on and listens when you touch it. So you can go, how tall is the Empire State Building? And then when you let go, it starts sending that query off to the crowd. The, the Empire State Building is 1,454 feet tall to the tip. I'm sorry to catch Marquez in some crazy positions while I pause the video. So he's going on to show you other examples of how this is used. For example, that the device is taking a photo and then telling you what is seeing in the photo. And all of that is very nice. The thing here is you communicate with this device with your voice and mostly this device is communicating back to you with voice. Now, as we know, language, spoken language specifically, is the least effective way to communicate information. It's simply not a good idea. If you have text in front of you, you can skim through the text with your eyes. You can get out the key points and then just go on. If you have pictures, you can look at multiple things at the same time and like that perceive a lot of information. So the big point here is information density. And of course, an AI device, an AI tool has the major job to have the highest information density and the highest information clarity so that it will take the cumbersome and time losing process 
out of the process for you and just gives you the information you need in a refined way. Your smartphone, which not only has a high resolution screen, but because you can see the things, you can make qualifying decisions about them. For example, seeing different kind of products, for example, food items and say, this looks delicious. This doesn't look delicious. So even though both of them are burgers, I want to have the first one. And then of course, also your phone has multi-touch, something that makes the whole process much faster and easier. So your eyes and your fingers are still some of the best interactive tools that we have. And of course, this is the reason why the main way we interact with your computer, with the screen, the keyboard and the mouse, you use the fingers for the input, you use your eyes for the output. We don't speak to the computer. It just doesn't make sense. It can also remember things you tell it to remember. And all these things will show up in the Humane Center. So it's like this online web portal for all things connected to the pin. There's no app, it's just the website. So there you can see a whole history of who you've called and texted and what you've listened to and what answers it gave to your most recent requests. This for me is another huge weakness in the design and functionality of this product. As you can see on this page, what you mainly get, I haven't personally interacted with this page, but what he's showing us here is simply listing the information of how you have interacted with the device. Now, the much more useful way to use all of that information would be data is for you processed, optimized, and then given back to you in a better format. For example, you say, go to that YouTube video, look through it and give me the ball points of that, make a little presentation for me. Those would have been really useful automation and taking work away from you, optimizing information, optimizing the process. This is the main job of AI is to help you not make stuff more complex. How does it really help me if I have a huge list of whatever I ever asked this device? They just listed there and I have to go through all of them. How does this help me in any way? It's best tech demo feature though is the translate back and forth. You got a two finger gesture. You can go, Donde esta la biblioteca? Where is the library? So it auto detects the language, translates it to English, and the person who speaks back can translate back as long as you hold down the pen and listen to them. There is so many mind blowing decisions on this device. First of all, of course, you have a conversation function already in Google Translate, but Google was smart enough. So you have an active conversation where the device figures out who is speaking at the time and then translates it into the other language. So you don't have to hold the button. Now, again, one of the downsides, the huge downsides here for this device is there is no screen. If you have simple sentences like where is the library? That isn't really a problem. But as soon as you have words like, for example, specific names or locations or you mumble words where the AI doesn't really understand what you say, this will be translated into something you never said and never meant. And you don't even have visual feedback to see in your own language what the device thinks you have said. So there is no way that you can figure out if the translation was what you actually meant to say. Pretty cool. This is all voice stuff though. So if at any point you're in a loud area or a very private area and you don't want to interact out loud with your voice, that's where this projector comes in. So it seems crazy, but you activate it like that and then you just hold your finger out, your whole palm, and it becomes a projector screen for the laser projector built into the pin. So it takes a little practice, but eventually you get used to holding your hand up in just the right spot. And then the UI gets projected in this green 720p mini screen on your hand. So you basically use your hand Try to be as flat as possible, and then to interact with it, there are some movement gestures. So there's a time of flight sensor that keeps track of movement, and you move your hand around kind of like rolling a... Look at what you see right now on the screen. First of all, you can see very, very low information density because the image is on an uneven surface and because of that it is unsharp and because of that all of the fonts all of the text all of the information has to be large now the other problem is because this is a laser it only has one color so you can't differentiate between different buttons between different elements that you're looking at 
just by the color. For example, when you go to a web page, you can see that the links are highlighted in blue. And I'm pretty sure you will have in your memory when you go to your phone, mostly the color of the icon and say, hey, that is YouTube. It's red. Boom. You click on that. Hey, that's Facebook. It's blue. Boom. I click on that. And none of that is given here. And on top of that, of course, you still have the problem that your hand is never completely flat. You have the daylight problem. And of course, you're standing there with your hand in front of you and the laser projecting on that. This is interesting for everybody around you. So every time you use this device, you can be absolutely certain that all the people around you are going to look at your hand and what you're doing there and reading the text because it has to be so big out of these limitations. Terrible idea. Marble around in your hand to select something then pinch to select. Uh, you can then make a fist to go back and then you literally push forward to move deeper into a menu. So this is like a 3D UI you have to learn. This is obviously very brand new for people, but I think to be fair, it is pretty intuitive. I think if you get a quick 60 second lesson, you kind of already have learned all the things you need. Because there's not much you can do, there's not much you can learn. At the same time, these simple functions you can do are still a lot less useful to you than the simple functions that you can do on your screen from the smartphone. Because first of all, not only do you have multi-touch on your screen, but also because of the precision that you can have on the screen combined with the information density on your screen. For example, having 24 icons on your screen and be quickly able to choose for them. But then of course, being able to use both of your hands at the same time when you use your device. While here, you're not just limited to one hand, you're limited to no hand because it doesn't use your hand. It uses the position and gesture of your hand. So you can't even type on something. This thing is bad at almost everything it does basically all the time. Where do I even start? So I guess, first of all, okay, it's supposed to just answer questions, right? It, can kind of do that sometimes, but one, it's often slow because most of these requests go to the cloud and come back and there's just a long wait. And two, it's often wrong because AI still can hallucinate and there are still issues with it just not understanding correctly or just saying the wrong thing. And that's not even mentioning server timeouts if you have a poor internet connection, which happens to me all the time in this studio. So when they do most of the demos like on their websites and in their videos, they'll ask a question and then they'll let go and keep talking to fill the silence. So it's not awkward as you wait for an answer and realize how long it is. But even on this fast studio Wi-Fi here, who designed the Washington Monument? Finding designer. The Washington Monument was designed by Robert Mills, a prominent 19th century American architect from South Carolina. The construction was eventually completed okay. by Thomas. So you can just hold your hand up to put your answer on your hand and interrupt that it's talking so much. A huge problem with this is that we have learned the expectation. Then things work for us immediately right away and we get really good answers in a very nice presentation. What I would rather have wished for this product to happen is that they focus on a specific thing that a lot of people use every day. Maybe just have an AI device for your everyday planning. The AI comes into play and helps you and does stuff for you. For, you. for example, being connected to your emails, being connected to your calendar, being connected to other data so it can actually help you plan the day, be more effective, save time, plan your routes. Be really focused just on that specific area it just doesn't make sense to compete with something where we already have a much better solution. Even that was like a pretty good performance for the AI pin in ideal fast Wi-Fi conditions. But there are many, many times when I feel like it's way slower and it, it seems like it goes to the internet for almost everything. I mean, there's a... This, by the way, is another huge point. If you have a device and all of its functionality, everything this is good for needs an internet connection. That means at every moment where you don't have a perfect internet connection, like for example, when you're in a tunnel, 
when you are in the subway, when you're out at the countryside, when you're inside a plane. You can't use the device at all. It's just useless at that moment. Now in comparison to that, you have your smartphone again. And this has a lot of applications on there where you can keep on working text memos, you can scribble, you can take voice memos and the device will work for you. And then when you are ready, it will connect to the internet and upload the stuff, sync it with the cloud services. So at least it would have made sense for this device to have a light version of the AI on the device that can do at least the simple tasks for you while you're offline and then sync up the rest for you when you're online again. When is the next Nets game? Finding next Nets game. The next Brooklyn Nets game is on Sunday, April 14th, but no specific opponent or location is provided. I just Googled it. It says it's the 76ers, so that's kind of weird. This again is not just a problem with the AI giving you wrong information or hallucinating information or lacking the information you actually asked for. It is also a problem again of the presentation of the information because if you have a more complex answer than this one and it is reading your longer text. The problem is how do you qualify the result if it's good, if it's not good. And because this is not connected to your phone, you can't even open up basically a second app to verify the information you just got, which is of course something you can do on your phone with multiple apps open at the same time. And you can even split the screen on your phone to use multiple apps at the same time it's already kind of bad enough that you have another device that you also have to charge every single day. But with this, it's actually more than that. You have to constantly babysit the battery and swap out boosters and charge this thing and keep it charged multiple times per day. So like I said before, you get two of these things that come with it. And I've had a pin nuke through the entire booster battery in two hours while not really doing much of anything. I've also had it last like four hours while doing a whole bunch of you know photos and videos and requests and laser stuff. So this is just another crazy element. How can a device that is so small doesn't even have a screen, doesn't really do anything special because the calculations are happening in the cloud, burn through two batteries in two hours or four hours? I don't really understand that, especially if you compare it again to your phone where you can play games, you watch videos, you can film in 8K, you can do crazy stuff on that and it will hold for hours and hours and just go on. This is just very crazy. And also for me, the question is if this device really only works, is only active when you touch it with your fingers, why is the energy spent so fast? unless it's working all the time. And it's also just like constantly warm the whole time, just all the time, which is a little bit concerning. I'll also say multiple times in various situations, I've had it just overheat for seemingly no reason and tell me to wait a while for it to cool down. I think the heat problem is also amplified because of the gap created by whatever fabric is between the booster and the product that it is actively inductively charging. You know, it is a lot of very impressive engineering, but wireless charging is notoriously inefficient and loses energy via heat. That's really good points. If you, for example, record a video on your GoPro with 8K resolution and a high frame rate, and it has to stabilize that video at the same time. I can see how that can overheat when you stand with that in your room, but this device, what does it specifically do that has overheating on its menu? I don't really understand that. It's well made. Like I said, it's really impressive hardware, but it's, it's just a little, I mean, you see that little sag? It's just a little too heavy. In the same way that Vision Pro is just a bit too heavy, when you're wearing the thing, you, you, you just want to make it as light as possible. It's why a lot of this stuff is made of plastic. So when you decide to go aluminum instead, yeah, it's just a little too heavy. I feel like Humane in a lot of their videos, they've got all these thick fabrics and like heavy jackets. This really rubs me the wrong way because you can see that they actively in these different shots that Marquez is showing always wear these thick materials. Because even though this device was specifically designed for the purpose of magnetically sticking to your clothing and 
being hauled up by the clothing, they would not show in their presentations that this is absolutely not good for your clothing because it makes them pull down and look terrible and also wiggle around all the time on top of your clothing. I feel like they kind of hit that with their videos by presenting it like that. They didn't point out that this is not going to be look good fashion wise. And of course, also people, if they would have seen that this would sag down your fashion in that way, immediately would have asked, why is this not on my wrist? And also another point here is because this is magnetically attached to your clothing, this is so easy to snatch off your clothing because the only way this is attached is by a magnet, not by any security pin or any other thing that makes it hard to get it off your clothing. When you feel like someone is bumping into you, you don't even pay attention to that in a crowded subway. Someone might have just snatched your $700 device from your chest. This pin cannot set a timer. This pin cannot set an alarm. Um, this notification light they put up at the corner here, it's there and it works, but it is basically out of my peripheral, my field of view, so I almost never see it. And you know, they also chose this corner for the light, which means it's designed to be worn on this half of the body, which is fine and you get used to it there, but that's also exactly where most seat belts go in the US anyway. So not their fault, just another annoying thing about using it. Overall, again, so many bad decisions for the design. I, I, it's like really crazy uh, to have all of that in just one device bundled up. Because, and again, the main question here is, why don't you have that on your arm or in your phone? Because on your arm, of course, you have your arm in your vision field. You can see when stuff is going on. And then how is it that very, very basic functionality like setting an alarm or a timer is not part of that? Isn't the main element of this device to be your AI assistant and then it can't remind you of stuff? How is that even possible? The photos look pretty bad and the videos look even worse. Uh, they're squarish in aspect ratio, very noisy, and they max out at 15 seconds. I can forgive that, that the pictures are not great, the videos are not great, because I think they are just there to help you analyze stuff with AI. I don't see really a reason why this has a 15 second video limit. Maybe there is not enough internal storage. Again, you can do all of that with your phone in a much better way. You can record as long as you want. And also, in case you didn't know, you can use your photo camera as a search device with Google search. You can just, there is a, there's a camera icon in the Google search on your phone. You just click on that and wherever you point your camera, you get a lot of information about that. I use that often when I travel and I want to know what I'm looking at. I just point the camera and it tells me in a second what I want to see and have the information about that. It's like a tourist guide in my pocket. This as the kind of information I want to have. This really helps me structure my life and have better experiences while being in the moment. And this is exactly what this pin should do for you. But apparently it doesn't do that at the moment. And there are no apps. Um, there just are no apps. There are, so when you first sign up with uh, your Humane account, you get to sync with four accounts. There are your Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Tidal. So the first three are basically for your contacts. And then the last one, Tidal is the exclusive music partner. So there is no Uber access. There is no Spotify access. There's no WhatsApp. There's no calendar, no Gmail, none, none of that stuff. I feel like this is going to be the main weakness of a lot of these devices that they are not fully integrated in whatever you already have out there, already the convenience you have in your everyday life. So why would you actively want to buy a device that makes your life harder instead of easier and gives you none of the connections, none of the integrations. You have to build up all of the data again. And then there isn't even the functionality of these apps. So all of the services you like, Amazon or where you order your food or where you listen to your music is not going to be part of that device. That completely removes almost all of the usefulness this device could ever have. Now, the other problem here is if it doesn't have apps, 
How is this open to developers? How is this supposed to grow if they would have said, OK, we don't have the Android store on there, so we don't have these apps, but we already have 15 apps developed by developers. We have some companies on board. We have here a development kit that you can download prior to the release of the device so you can create apps on your own that can do stuff and that will highly enhance the ability of the device. This would maybe be the saving branch that this device needs to have a projected usability and also some use cases that you can test right now. Nobody expects from this thing to be perfect from the first second, but at least give me something I can do. I don't understand these decisions. I really don't understand these decisions. It's just it doesn't have I can't book a flight. I can't buy something on Amazon. It just will not do any of that stuff that uh, they just do on my phone. Smartphones are kind of OP. Like that's the number one thing I've reminded myself from the week of using this pin, trying to get it to do stuff is that smartphones are not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay, there seems like a lot of overlap between what this is and what a smartphone can do. But everything that this pin does, a modern smartphone does better and faster and easier and in higher quality and just better in every way. This is one of the major problems of new products and specifically this product. And it is the major rule of designing a new product. You cannot design something that already is there on the market in a better way and then present a worse solution for that. You have to look at the market at the problems that people have in their real life and figure out where can I fit in to two things that have to fit together. One thing is there isn't a solution yet for a big problem that people have. And the other reason, the other point is there have to be a lot of people searching for that solution, having that need, having that itch, and you're the one to scratch that itch. If you create a product with a solution that nobody cares for, and then that solution doesn't even work, and there is better solutions out there, why would anybody ever adapt that if there is no selling point to the thing you want to sell? Do you know what happens when you try to just send someone a picture from the AI pin. You already know how to do it on your phone. With the AI pin, okay, you take the picture, then you either try this with your voice or you pull up the picture, which is just a green 720p JPEG on your hand. I, I guess that's a good enough preview, sure. You go to send it, you pick your contact or type in the whole phone number with the gestures. Eventually you go to send, and it has its own internet connection and it sends a link to view the picture in the humane web portal. That is absolutely insane. The only reason that I can think why they would do that, actually two reasons. One reason is maybe they did that because they thought this might go viral because if they send a link instead of the picture, the people have to go to that service and then they have some free marketing for the device so they might find new customers. But the other reason, and I think this is maybe more likely in that kind of situation, is that they just didn't want to spend the money to make this actually nice and you get the picture in a nice way. So um, yeah, I don't know. I think this is just a result of shortcuts. That's just my assumption. But this is such a crazy, faulty, problematic solution. I just I lack words on, on how annoying and crazy this is. Look and tell me what this is. Or I'll just do this, I guess. Ah. It's a Cybertruck. The photo is of a Cybertruck, an electric pickup truck produced by Tesla. 
this is exactly the thing I talked about before. Your phone already has visual search, can tell you what's in the image. But what you've also seen here again about the information density on your display is not only do you get the answer that this is the Cybertruck, you also get images of a Cybertruck to verify and you can visually compare if this is really a Cybertruck because often you might get an answer from a search where it tells you, hey, this is this person or this is that object and actually it isn't. It's just something that looks similar and the search is mistaken, but without visual feedback, you don't have a way to verify that. But I think most critically for the AI assistant part, I actually love the idea of a virtual assistant that you can talk to like a human. Like this is something we've been chasing for years with Google Assistant and Siri and Alexa. This is a point where I actually have to disagree with Marques. I don't think there are many people out there who really enjoy to talk to Siri or any kind of other voice interaction with a bot. Now, in everyday life, a lot of people don't really want to talk even to other people just to get across what they want to have in a kind of service situation or things like that. They rather go to an app and just book it there and order it there. Then the problem is that you can't close your ears. That is one of the main elements about sound is you will hear every sound around you. So whatever you do on this device with your voice, everybody around you is going to know in real time when they listen to you. And that is just very uncomfortable. I don't want to be in a cafe and then tell everybody around me what I want to do, what I search for and get more search for. Imagine how annoying it's going to be when people instead of sitting around you in cafes and looking at their screen quietly and doing whatever they do on there. They constantly speak with that device and make corrections and send messages and say at the lol smiley. No, I, I don't want that world. I don't want to be in that world. The thing about a good assistant is it needs to know everything about you. That's, that's even true with a human assistant. Like it needs to know your schedule. It needs to know where you go every day. It needs to know who you talk to, where your preferences are personally and for products. Like it needs to know everything about you. And your smartphone already knows a lot of things about you. But this is a standalone device that doesn't talk to your phone. And so it doesn't know any of the things about you that your phone knows. So just from that, it's already at such a massive disadvantage. Again, that is a major point where this device is really lacking and it was a really bad decision to not integrate it in the environmental landscape you already have. Point of the landscape of information that an application is included in is a major point of its usability. And in a second, he's also going to make the point that this device, because it is not connected to your apps, it's not connected to your devices, it can only capture part of what is going on throughout the day. So only the conversations where this device was actively included in will be recorded on their website and then can be analyzed and processed and presented to you as your day. All of the rest that you have done with your phone or without this device cannot be captured. So whatever the information that will be presented to you as an overlook of your day is lacking most of that information and because of that is becoming really useless. Now compare that, for example, to Gemini or other AIs that are integrated in most of the tools you're using every day, especially in the case of Google, if you're a Google user already and you use Google search, you use Gmail, you use Google Docs, you use Google Photos, the AI is built in there. It has access to your information. It can handle this information, it can process the information for you. And because of that, it can be a very useful assistant and do a lot of jobs for you. Again, this is the main thing. AI is supposed to help us, is supposed to be an assistant. This device, as it exists today, is hamstrung by its ideal future version of itself. It's like Vision Pro. Like I talked about it in the Vision Pro review. It doesn't actually pair to your iPhone in any way. It's its own standalone computer. And of course, Apple sees down the road that could just be like a little pair of smart glasses. You don't need an iPhone to use that. Now, the big difference here between this device and the Apple Vision Pro is that 
it was a specific strategic move that is not connecting to your phone so that you have this exclusive and focused experience on this VR or spatial computing scenario experience and also work process that they want to get you into. But also, on the other hand, a very important part for the Apple Vision Pro is that it is connected to the App Store, it is connected to the Apple landscape. So even if it doesn't connect to your phone, it still has full access to the landscape of the Apple enriched environment that you are already in as an Apple user. And of course, it not only allows you to use iPad apps on your Vision Pro, it also opens it up for developers to develop all kinds of specific spatial computing and VR apps that you can buy and make this tool a lot more useful. So there is a very specific strategy, not just to separate this out and differentiate it from your phone, but also in the way this is integrated in an already existing rich landscape, but then also opened up to developers. All of that makes it a very good and solid position where the Apple Vision Pro is compared to this device, which stands completely alone, goes against all of your expectation. And there is not really any specific reasoning behind that that makes this more useful to you. If you ask me, like, who should buy this device right now? I mean, nobody should buy this device right now, but if, if there's one person who would most consider it, it's the person that wants to spend as little time as possible with a screen in their hands. That is a good point. I would interject at that point that AR would be the solution for that. That can be done already. It can be done in color. We have devices that are almost as light as glasses. You can interact with them. They can record videos for you and so on. So that would have made so much more sense for this device if you want to go without a screen that you can either listen through the device as the glasses on your head or you can have information projected to you that is not taking you out of your everyday experience. You can stay in the moment. I think these kind of staying in the moment situations where AI is doing stuff for you in the background as your virtual existence are the future. They are very helpful. They make a lot of sense, but they have to be integrated in your life in a way that is more convenient than what we have right now is less intrusive than what we have right now. And of course, is fun to use. None of that, sadly, is fulfilled by this product. Overall, I think this should have been done in a much better way. The communication about the limitations of this device from the design, from the functionality should have been much clearer, much more open, much more transparent. And why not have apps on the device or on your cloud so developers can add functionality? Today, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest rules if you want to be in everyday lives is don't build a device, build a platform, create a landscape where everybody can flourish together because only then it can be a useful device that for everybody has its purpose and for everybody finds its place. And this is just not it. I'm really sad to say that and I'm really worried and annoyed by this. This is why I made this video. Let me know in the comments what you think about this device. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Bye. Oh, you're still here. So uh, this is the end screen. There's other stuff you can watch like this or that's really cool. And yeah, I hope I see you soon. Uh, leave a like if you haven't yet. And well, um, yeah.